We can only say with certainty that somewhere very far away the world is very different from what we see locally. Whether it is another universe or a different fabric of space-time, we don't know. Those are the words of a cosmologist Alexander Kashlinsky. But are there actually reasons to say that and why does the scientist think so? Is the universe infinite? We don't know for sure. At least, most likely, it is bigger than the part of the universe we can see, which we usually call the observable universe. For us, it is limited by a particle horizon. Our universe, as far as we know, had the beginning, and also the speed of light has a finite value. So the light had only about 13.8 billion years to reach us. We live in the center of an imaginary bubble of our observable universe, but outside of that bubble, the universe most likely doesn't end. The quote I began this video with states that there, beyond the horizon, the universe can be very different from what we see in our part. Although many scientists believe that outside of our observable universe, it just continues. There's just more universe with the familiar laws of physics, stars, galaxies, etc. The problem is that we cannot possibly test that. We cannot see beyond the particle horizon. But what if there is something outside our observable universe, and that something affects the parts of the universe we can see, and what if we can detect this? The quote refers to the thing known as the dark flow. A quite controversial story. Alexander Kashlinsky is one of the authors of the original study where the discovery of the dark flow was claimed. The basic idea is this. According to some data, galaxies across the observable universe move or sort of flow in one specific direction. Which would be surprising in itself, but what is worse, the point those galaxies are supposedly attracted to is outside of our observable universe. So what could that be? Another universe? Some kind of anomaly? So let's try to tackle this controversial story where some scientists claim that dark flow might exist and others, well, disagreed. So what is the dark flow? How was the supposed discovery made and why is it so weird? And how it is different from the great attractor? Let's talk about all this and more. And my name is Andre and this is Cosmos Elementary. The universe must not have special places or directions. At least that is what most scientists believe today, and that's what's known as the cosmological principle. The universe has to be homogeneous and isotropic. What does this mean? There are no special places. Looks like the universe has a lot of places that are different from one another. On this scale, it doesn't look very homogeneous. Neither it does on this scale and this. And even on such simulations where we can already see giant filaments of galaxy clusters, it still doesn't look too uniform. And yet, the bigger we go, the more uniform the distribution of matter in the universe gets. So the cosmological principle talks about the largest scales. And when we say the universe is isotropic, we mean it shouldn't have any preferred direction. No matter which way you look from where you are, the large-scale structure of the universe looks the same, and it should be true for any point of observation in the universe. So according to this principle, there shouldn't be flows of galactic clusters on such scales, their motions should be random. This is why the dark flow, if it existed, would be a huge problem for cosmology, because it would violate one of the most fundamental principles of modern cosmology. So either those who discovered it are wrong and it doesn't exist, or our modern understanding of the universe is deeply flawed. Some of you might say, wait a minute, and what about the great attractor? How is it different, and why is it not that controversial? I'll get back to that. First, it may not be very intuitive how a large number of galaxies can move in one specific direction. Everything in the universe is in constant motion. Even if an object seems to be at rest, there is always a frame of reference in which it is in motion. Even if you are, let's say, sitting on a chair, if we account for various components like Earth's rotation, its orbital motion, the motion of the solar system in the galaxy, the motion of the galaxy in our local group and so on, you are, of course, in motion and also following a pretty complicated trajectory. And what about galaxy clusters? So how do galaxy clusters appear to move for us, observing in the center of our local bubble of the universe? There are two components. First is the so-called Hubble flow, the apparent motion of galaxies due to the expansion of the universe. And the second component is the peculiar velocity. 
This animation demonstrates the Hubble flow pretty well. In this case, galaxies aren't actually moving through space. The space-time itself expands, thus the distance between galaxies increases. It is observed that the farther the galaxy is, the faster it proceeds. But of course, galaxies in clusters and even clusters themselves don't just idly sit by in their local coordinates. They affect each other gravitationally and that defines their peculiar motion. The most obvious example of that is how our galaxy and Andromeda galaxy are currently moving towards each other. So peculiar velocity is deviation from the Hubble flow and the actual motion is combination of the Hubble flow and the peculiar velocity. Usually we can measure not all of the components of the peculiar motion of such galaxies in 3D. We mostly can see how the galaxies move along the line of sight. Also, the farther the galaxy is, the less detectable is its peculiar velocity, because the motion due to the expansion of the universe becomes more and more significant. Why did I mention peculiar velocity? Because measurements of the peculiar velocity of galaxy clusters led to the supposed discovery of the dark flow. Well, the paper that started the whole thing is called A Measurement of Large-Scale Peculiar Velocities of Clusters of Galaxies, Results and Cosmological Implications. So how was it discovered? Well, might have been discovered. And also it is called dark, not because it is literally dark. In this case, the word dark is used in the similar manner as it is used in dark matter or dark energy. They are called dark also because we don't really know much about them. So what did Alexander Kashlinsky and his colleagues do? Oh, it is actually very simple. They used kinematic sunev zeldovich effect to measure peculiar velocities of galaxy clusters relative to the cosmic microwave background. Easy! But okay, I've already talked about peculiar velocities, so let's talk about kinematic sunev zeldovich effect. The effect was predicted by Rashid Sunaev and Yakov Zeldovich. In short, sunev zeldovich effect is distortions or changes in the intensity of different parts of cosmic microwave background radiation, or CMB for short. As some of you probably know, CMB, cosmic microwave background, is the microwave radiation we observe across the whole sky. It is the earliest radiation in the universe we are able to observe. It occurred the moment the universe expanded and cooled down enough so it became transparent and the light could travel freely. The farther we look into the universe, the more distant past we see, but there is a limit for the electromagnetic radiation and that limit is CMB. It is one of the most important things for cosmology and the source of a lot of our knowledge of the universe. Initially it was visible light, but after billions of years of traveling through the universe, the wave stretched, so now it is microwave radiation and its temperature is 2.725 Kelvin. CMB photons began their journey way before the first stars and galaxies formed, and it is very uniform across the whole sky. Though it might not seem to be the case if we look at the CMB map like this one, but actually the temperature variations that are shown here in different colors are tiny and they are measured in 10 or even 100,000th part of Kelvin. It is believed that those fluctuations are the result of minor variations in the density of matter in the early universe, when 380,000 years after the Big Bang it became transparent for radiation. Those density variations could eventually lead to the formation of large-scale structure of the universe – galaxies, clusters and superclusters of galaxies. But we know all that, but what about sunev zeldovich effect? Well, CMB photons we receive have been traveling to us for almost as long as the universe existed – minus 380,000 years. Obviously, those photons don't just travel through emptiness, they emit stuff – galaxy clusters, hot gas, or plasma that fills those clusters, and so on. The light interacts with matter and that affects the wavelength of radiation. It can either give energy to the matter and lower this way its own energy, or in the case of interacting with hot plasma, the energy of electrons in that plasma can be higher than the energy of radiation, so it can go up. In general, we expect the energy of radiation that has been traveling for billions of years to decrease. But then we also see that in some portions of the sky, CMB is distorted and it lines up with the locations of galaxy clusters. So those distortions are the sunev zeldovich effect, but also there are different kinds of that effect. There is thermal effect that is caused by the interactions with hot plasma. But also there is kinematic effect, which is the result of the motion of the gas the light interacts with. If the motion of gas deviates from the Hubble flow, it can add more distortions to the CMB, and that we can detect. 
And that's what's important, especially if we can separate measurements of kinematic effect from the thermal one, which can be done. And it allows us to measure velocities of distant objects, in this case, galaxy clusters. Alexander Kashlinsky and his co-authors in their original study used three years' worth of WMAP observatory data and also a catalog of 700 galaxy clusters. So basically, you take a map of the CMB, then put a map of galaxy clusters over it. So, if those clusters do distort the CMB and if it is possible to measure the kinematic cinei zoldovich effect, we could figure out the velocity of those clusters relative to the CMB, how it deviates from the Hubble flow. Though it is way more difficult to measure kinematic effect, because it is much weaker than the thermal effect, and when you try to measure the kinematic effect for a single cluster, it results in large errors. According to Kashlinsky, if we use a large number of clusters, the effect can be measured more precisely. That's why they used 700 galaxy clusters in their study. So, as a result, instead of motions of clusters in random directions, they apparently found a large-scale flow of galaxies towards this portion of the sky between constellations Vela and Centaurus. That was called the dark flow. Obviously, a lot of scientists met those conclusions with skepticism. As I've said, such motion, if existed, would contradict the cosmological principle. By the way, how is this different from the Great Attractor? It seems similar. A large number of galaxies move toward a certain area of the sky, and yet the Great Attractor is not that controversial. Well, first, the scale is different. In the case of the Great Attractor, a gravitational anomaly, we deal with the local part of the universe, specifically the Laniakea supercluster. It is a huge structure of galaxy clusters in which we live. The Great Attractor is a region in space, a concentration of mass that attracts galaxies. In the center of that region is the massive Norma Cluster. But perhaps there are other clusters that also play a role in the movement of galaxies that is associated with the Great Attractor. For instance, Shapley Superclusters and Vela Supercluster. But those all are known clusters that are well inside the observable universe, and they appear to attract galaxies in our local patch of the universe. But the dark flow, if it's real, exists across the whole observable universe. And to explain such a large-scale flow, the point of attraction has to exist outside of the observable universe. And what exactly might that be, we cannot possibly know. Some massive structures outside the observable universe? A different universe? It is believed that the universe expanded very rapidly during the inflation period, in the very beginning of the existence of the universe. So, if the motion due to the dark flow occurs because of the gravitational attraction of matter that is outside the observable universe, it could at least tell us that there is something, which probably there is, but we can't check it. Also, it could allow us to indirectly study the period of the universe we cannot access with telescopes, the time before CMB occurred if the dark flow exists. But maybe the conclusions of that study are just wrong. After the first study, the same team attempted to test their initial conclusions. In 2010, they published a paper where they used five years of WMAP observations instead of three years and doubled the number of galaxy clusters. They also divided those clusters in four groups based on the distance, to check whether the direction changes when the distance increases. Here on this whole sky map, points of different colors show those four groups of clusters. And these areas show directions of their motion. They are not aligned perfectly, but still it's quite close, and according to the authors of the study, there is a common trend. Those clusters are across the whole sky, and they go at least as deep as 2.5 billion light-years from us. Again, the group of scientists confirmed their initial conclusions that the dark flow might exist. But obviously not everyone agreed, and not all of the studies confirmed the results. Different group of scientists used seven years of WMAP observations, used their own filters and concluded that there is no such large-scale flow. So basically, according to them, Kashlinsky and his team are wrong. There is another paper from 2013, and here scientists didn't see the dark flow either. And by the way, WMAP data is not the best available observations of the CMB. There is a different observatory, Planck, and its maps are way more detailed. In 2013, a large paper with intermediate results of Planck was published. This study involved 175 scientists. And as a result of the complex data analysis, the team concluded that there was no dark flow. 
But there was even a little drama. A scientist from the Planck group disagreed with the conclusions of the colleagues and stated that they overestimated the uncertainties in measurements, and even asked to be removed from the list of the people who worked on the paper. And after that, Kashlinsky and his colleagues wrote another paper in 2015 that was based on nine years of observations of WMAP and also they used Planck data. And guess what they found? That's right, they still saw evidence for the existence of the dark flow. So and what should we do with it? I often say something like, according to the best modern theories, or as most scientists believe today, and so on. So the dark flow is definitely not one of those cases. There is still no agreement on whether it exists or not. What is interesting that here is not the argument between some charlatans and actual scientists. No. But perhaps that's one of the pillars of the scientific process. Some scientists conduct studies, others test their conclusions, and as a result we can gain some new information about our universe. Thanks for watching! If you enjoyed that video, leave a like, comment, subscribe not to miss the new vids, and share this one if you really liked it. Bye!